Honestly, I, I still miss the birds I missed before. <laughs> I, I still hit the birds I hit before. Um, you know, <laughs> as far as uh, my shot selection hasn't changed at all, um, I'm still able to, to make the same shots I was making previously. Um, I, I, I still you know shed the same tear when I when I see a leg drop and I know that that bird got away. It's not because of the shot; it's because of the person. Hi, I'm Drew Youngdike, and this is Conservation Country. On today's episode, we'll talk with Jason Dinsmore, Interim Executive Director of the Minnesota Conservation Federation, about public lands, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and why you should switch to lead-free ammo for hunting, and what's going on with the boundary waters. We recorded this last month before the old Congress departed without renewing the Land and Water Conservation Fund, and the new one inherited a shutdown government. The Land and Water Conservation Fund still needs to be renewed, though, so our call for Congress to renew it in this episode is as urgent as the day we originally recorded it. Also, I've learned since that the Minnesota Conservation Federation is co-hosting a rally for public lands on February 7th, 2019 at the Minnesota State Capitol. Conservation Country is a podcast from the National Wildlife Federation, featuring conservation issues from across the country through interviews with the conservationists behind the scenes, working hard every day for our fish and wildlife. The National Wildlife Federation is the nation's largest grassroots conservation organization, representing 51 state and territorial affiliates from statewide hunting coalitions to state environmental leagues. Its mission is to unite all Americans to ensure wildlife thrive in a rapidly changing world. Conservation Country is supported by Rep Your Water and their 3% for conservation commitment. And as a Rep Your Water conservation partner, sales of Great Lakes, Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana Rep Your Water gear help to support the National Wildlife Federation's work to protect our water and stop Asian carp. You can find these at repyourwater.com. Before we get to today's interview, I need to ask for your help, though. If Asian carp get into the Great Lakes, they'll have devastating impacts on fisheries throughout the region, as they've done throughout the Mississippi River Basin since escaping decades ago from fish farms during flooding. Their front line is only 50 miles from Lake Michigan, south of Chicago. There is a plan to stop them, though, by rebuilding the Brandon Road Lock and Dam. The final draft is out for public comment right now, and we expect it will be submitted to Congress later this year. They need to hear from you to support it. Learn more at www.nwf.org slash graylakes. And now for this episode with Jason Dinsmore at the Minnesota Conservation Federation. Hi, I'm Drew Youngdike, and this is Conservation Country. For this episode of Conservation Country, I'm here with Jason Dinsmore, Interim Executive Director of the Minnesota Conservation Federation, and my colleague here at the National Wildlife Federation. Jason's a native of Michigan. Actually, we both cut our chops uh, working for our Michigan affiliate, the Michigan United Conservation Clubs, uh, representing hunters, anglers, and trappers in the Great Lakes State. And now he goes to Minnesota, where they have they claim ten thousand lakes, which is which is okay. But I do have to brag that Michigan has eleven thousand. Um, so, anyways, before we uh, waste any more time with with my banter, um, we'll introduce Jason. Jason, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Drew. Um, you know, we, we prefer quality over quantity in Minnesota, so you can have eleven thousand. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll prefer our better ten thousand. Yeah. There you go. Um, so you're the interim executive director of the Minnesota Conservation Federation, which is the state affiliate for the National Wildlife Federation. Um, for folks that that, are, that don't know that haven't heard our earlier podcast, the National Wildlife Federation is a national federation, of course, uh, made up of state affiliates who are independent organizations that set our policy. About half of our affiliates are your kind of traditional hook and bullet hunting and fishing organizations, the other half are kind of environmental bird watching organizations, and when those two uh, sectors of conservation can agree on policy, that's what we advocate on. Um, where where does Minnesota Conservation Federation fall on that? What's what's the history of that organization and kind of what do you guys work on? Sure, well, there's any number of ways of looking at the, the groups that make up the federation. You know, you mentioned the, the, the cast and blast versus kind of the more traditional green uh, oriented organizations. Um, they don't necessarily follow the, the, the political maps, you know, entirely, but, but generally so. You know, the, the coastal versus the interior uh, organizations, you can kind of look at the camo versus the coasts um, a little bit. 
Um, and, and you're right. You know, the, the, much of our strength is derived from, from those uh, initiatives that we can kind of agree upon and, and then see common ground in, and, and all, the, all the better for it for that diversity. Um, as far as Minnesota Conservation Federation goes, you know, we're, we're, we're middle of the road. You know, we're, we're, we're a very purple state in Minnesota, um, and, and the organization follows that. You know, we, we have, uh, I think, you know, in, in the broad sense, we, we definitely are a little bit more of the traditional cast and blast. Um, you know, we've been around since 1937 uh, and, and find our roots in, in kind of the recovery of the market hunting days, uh, similar to the National Wildlife Federation. You know, and, and, and we were, our strength was derived from, you know, similar to NWF, you know, that, that, that broad-based conservation movement that occurred in the 30s and 40s and brought us through the, the kind of the enlightenment days of the, the 60s and 70s uh, with clean air, clean water, um, and, uh, and found us to today. You know, uh, Michigan United Conservation Clubs, where we both used to work at, at different times, um, but they were founded in 1937 too. Um, it seems like a lot of the the the, uh, the state conservation organizations were founded in 1937, a year after the National Wildlife mm -hmm. Federation was founded. Um, is that coincidence, or is 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 there a story behind that? No, you know, and I think that that you can see that uh, it's not coincidence at all. Um, you know, the the origins of many of our state based organizations, like Minnesota Conservation Federation or Michigan Ed Conservation Clubs. You know, come from that that original meeting uh, in, in the 1936 kind of uh, you know uh, time frame um, where NWF has its origins uh, from that original meeting. Those, those conservation voices, those those activists at the time, whatever, um, they spread back out. They, they, they went home, you know, and, and they brought that that kind of uh, that energy that, that came out of that 1936 meeting with National Wildlife that that spurred National Wildlife Federation. They brought it home to their home clubs, to their home organizations. To their, you know, and, and there were there were gentlemen's clubs of the day. There there were hunting clubs. There were shooting clubs back, you know, just like there is today. Um, and and those organizations saw that spark. They saw that energy coming out of uh, out of D.C. and it's it spurred, you know, um, down home conservation kind of movement, if you will, in each of the individual states as well. So this grassroots conservation movement that that still lives on today in the way that both the the. The state federations and the national federation are structured. Mm -hmm. um, does that affect how you set your policies? What you decide, you know, when you decide to take a position on a conservation issue, how do you make that decision as a state federation? Sure, you know, conservation you know, conservation groups is just like any other nonprofit; they evolve. Uh, and, but our, our basic bedrock is still that that grassroots movement, still the you know the the democratic process by which we set our policy. Um, and it's, it's a resolution derived process where we're by one of our affiliates, um, you know, similar to NWF, we are a federation as well. Um, so we have, you know, 30 to 35 affiliates, you know, that, that would then come together and, and draft policy. They, they draft these positions that they, that are either based on what they're feeling, what they're seeing, what they're experiencing in their own neck of the woods or what they're seeing at the statewide level or at the federal level for that matter. Um, that they want to make sure that Minnesota Conservation Federation has a strong policy, has a strong position from which to to advance our conservation goals and interests. Um, and so, you know, those policies can range from anything you know, specific to a specific water body, all the way up to larger initiatives like Land and Water Conservation Fund, or you know, lead or in the environment from either hunting or fishing tackle, or or whatever else it may be. And uh, Jason, actually, it was just a couple weeks ago, I think I saw that you wrote an op-ed urging Congress to renew the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, was that in the, the Rochester newspaper? Uh, the Post Bulletin, uh, the, the Star Tribune. We've had a number of LTEs and, and op-eds that have run uh, as part of a larger campaign uh, here in the last couple months with a, with a hard push towards reauthorization, uh, like you mentioned, of, of Land and Water Conservation Fund. Um, unfortunately, that expired. You know, that expired back end of October. You know, so the first of November saw us without an authorized land and water conservation fund, which, which puts a huge hole in the conservation movement, if you will. Um, you know, that, that's what should be up to $400 million a year. The reality is because of co congressional uh, meddling, maybe we'll, we'll call it, and robbing Peter to pay Paul, you know, they, they, it's been more around $200 million a year. Uh, but uh, even still, you know, it, it's a lot of money to, to, to bedrock conservation goals and interests, whether it's access to land, it's purchases of land, it's improvement to, to recreational opportunities in our individual states. And it's everything from you know, softball diamonds and, and baseball and to, to swimming pools to, to public land uh, for hunting and fishing. 
If there's any uh, representatives or congressmen or congresswomen who are listening, renew the Land and Water Conservation Fund, permanently fund it. Um, and then you don't have to listen to Jason and I talking and writing about it every couple of years. Um, now, that, that's one of the federal policies that Minnesota Conservation Federation is part of this uh, big push um, trying to get the Land and Water Conservation Fund renewed. But you're also working on state-based policies mm-hmm. as well. Um, you just had a conservation policy meeting this past weekend. Um, what was the major thing that you guys were looking at there? Sure. As part of our quarterly meeting, and, and our quarterly meetings are typically more policy-derived, as you mentioned, um, and one of the, 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 the major kind of initiative on, on our agenda this time around was uh, lead, yeah, and, and lead in hunting and fishing tackle. Uh, so that would be your, your, your shotguns, your your rifles, pistols, other kind of single projectile, multi projectile loads for the firearm side. And then on, on the fishing side, it's, it's your jigs, your sinkers, your, your other things that, that typically, you know, in, in just in practice have been more lead derived. And um, it seems like this comes up every couple of years. Um, of course, a couple of decades ago, National Wildlife Federation actually led the push to get waterfowl hunting made non toxic. Um, through uh, the adoption of steel shot and banning uh, lead shot for waterfowl hunting. But in other areas, it seems like it's being more commonly voluntarily adopted by hunters and anglers. Um, But it also seems like every once in a while it creates controversy. What did you guys learn from from that meeting, that presentation? Where does, where, where do your clubs look at this at this point? Sure. Well, I guess just by way of background for, you know, for the listeners out there, you know, lead is, you know, it's been around since time immortal. You know, as far as, you know, as far and our connection to lead is, it goes back just as far. You know, it, it, it's pretty readily available out there surface. You know, you don't have to dig very far to find it. It's very malleable. It, it's, it's very, very usable to, you know, to, to, to man as a whole. Yeah. And, and we used to put lead in a lot of things. You know, we put lead in paint, we put lead in gasoline, we put lead in our water pipes. Um, you know, so, you know, our use of lead goes back a really long ways. Um, you know, Romans use lead in, in, in their transfer of water in addition to the storage of food. And, and, and a lot of historians kind of place the fall of the Roman Empire on the use of lead. And, and as, as, as usable as it is and as freely available as it is, it's also really bad. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a universally recognized neurotoxin. Um, you know, and it's been recognized by that. Uh, as that for for a long time as well, Ben Franklin. You know, in Ben Franklin's time, you know, they used to actually penalize distillers for using lead in the creation of of, of uh, spirits, you know, alcohol. Um, and you know, actually, you know, even going back to the 1900s, you know, we already have research showing that that lead is highly toxic. And and the the, the, the main kind of culprit at that time was was lead paint. And it still took us until the 1970s to actually ban lead paint. So that there's this wide arc of, of, of history where we can identify the problem and it still takes us a, a fair amount of time and research, rightfully so in a lot of cases, um, to, to, to kind of come to some policy solution, if you will. Um, and that's how we look at lead in, in hunting and fishing as well. Um, we, you know, our clubs, Minnesota Conservation Federation uh, as a whole, you know, see an opportunity here for education, see an opportunity for increased research, see an opportunity for, to bring the hunting community and the fishing community uh, together over, you know, a common interest in not only in, in the wildlife that we pursue, uh, but also, our, you know, our kids. Uh, you know, because lead is a neurotoxin, we want to make sure that, you know, the, the meat that we're putting on the table, whether it be fish or game, um, is as healthy as possible. You know, the, the original organic only only really applies to that game you're putting on the table if it's also, you know, not harmful <laughs> to right. the people eating it. Um, and, and so, you know, we're undertaking this initiative now to, to kind of bring that discussion to the forefront, trying to depoliticize it as much as possible, and look at some voluntary measures. Look at other states that are, that are, that are bringing forward some really good educational campaigns, working with their federal partners, um, and, and making sure that we're doing it in a way that, that, that is science-based, that's both social and biological. <laughs> Um, and, and as well as, as it can be done in a way that that is publicly acceptable, so they don't have that knee-jerk reaction, whether it be political or otherwise, that that that, that comes at a, at a contrarian view and, and and really just you know gums up the process, if you will. You know, and that that public support is so important, not just for public support by hunters to adopt um, non-toxic shot and and things like copper bullets, but also public support for hunting. And what I keep noticing in the news is I don't think it's at a large population level, but certainly when you see a bald eagle uh, go into a treatment center and have to be put down because it has lead poisoning from Mm -hmm. 
uh, eating the gut pile of a, of, a, of a deer that was shot with a lead bullet, that's going to make news. Mm-hmm. And whether while, while eagles are recovering, they're certainly one of our, our great conservation success stories. Every time you see a newspaper headline about a dead eagle, hunters look bad. Mm-hmm. And with dropping hunter, hunter numbers across the country and support for hunters generally lagging behind support for the practice of hunting in general, I think that we have to do everything that we can within our power to make sure that we're hunting in a way that not only is ethical toward the species that we're hunting, but causes no unnecessary harm to the species that we're not targeting. Um, so I, I actually switched to copper bullets this year for hunting, even though I didn't, I didn't get a shot. But I just want to make sure that, look, I'm trying to get venison for the table, lean, healthy, organic meat. But I also want to make sure I'm not killing eagles afterwards. It's going to end up in the local paper and make every hunter look bad. Um, you've been using steel shot for grouse hunting for quite a while, um, just on an individual basis. How, how have you found that to be as far as its effectiveness for, for how you hunt? Sure. You know, anytime we talk about, you know, transitions from lead, you know, there, there's a couple big concerns that, that kind of come to the forefront. You know, one is cost. You know, the other is you know efficiency. You know, does it does it produce a humane kill? You know, and, and the other is just you know, the externalities of the cost. And, and so you're you're talking about efficiency at that point, and and, and, and uh, lethality or you know kind of humaneness, if you will. You know, any any, any number of terms you can be put on that. Um, and it's just as effective. You know, I think. Um, you know, I, I transitioned from. From lead to lead alternatives, you know, steel, bismuth, um, you know, heavy shot, kind of there, there's a, a continuum of op- options. You know, if you look at the Fish and Wildlife Services website, um, I, it fills up your, your page as, or your screen as far as the number of options that are non lead alternatives. Um, you know, I, you know, in that transition, you know, f- four years ago or so, um, there was a learning curve, like any, like any other new equipment. You know, you kind of need to know what you're looking for, and you kind of in, in, in shot size selection and everything else. Um, honestly, I, I still miss the birds I missed it before. <laughs> I, I still hit the birds I hit before. Um, you know, <laughs> as far as uh, my shot selection hasn't changed at all, um, I'm still able to, to make the same shots I was making previously. Um, I, I, I still, you know, shed the same tear when I when I see a leg drop and I know that that bird got away. It's not because of the shot; it's because of the person taking it. <laughs> right. Um, you know, and, and, and so um, you know, as far as uh, efficiency and efficacy, yes, you know, and, and, uh, and research proves that out. You know, once again, so it's going back to, to, to science based solutions. You know, there, there's been a, a great deal of research. You know, from the the 1980s on. You know, the the first phase in of lead. Or lead alternative requirements for waterfowl started in the '88. Um, you know, after some litigation, you mentioned with the National Wildlife Federation, we kind of brought that to the forefront. Um, you know, they started doing research at that point because there was a big concern about you know the the manufacturer of, of steel shot whether or not the technology was really caught up to where it needed to be to be mandatory. And you know, they, they did find at that at that early stage that that there there was a, a gap there. There was a lag behind where we had a, a, a tick up of, of crippling rates. Yeah, I guess we'll call it. You know, um, since that time, there has been a steady decline in crippling uh, for non-lead shot, for lead alternatives, to the point that crippling rates now in waterfowl are at pre-1980s levels. And so, you know, the, the, they're, they're, they're well beyond, or well below, I should say, um, what the levels were previous to, to mandatory lead, uh, uh, lead-free uh, ammunition for waterfowl. Uh, and, and the manufacturers are catching up to the, those non-waterfowl species as well. You know, the, the, the six, the sevens, uh, the, the, the typical not, uh, small game loads are, are readily available and, and non-toxic. Other sectors of the industry still need to catch up a little bit. The, the rimfire, for example, you know, there's not a whole lot of rimfire options that are, that are non-lead. Um, uh, but you mentioned centerfire. Centerfire is there, you know, mass produced, um, you know, Hornady, Barnes, you know, all, all the major brands carry now alternatives and single shot projectiles. Yeah, and even Winchester, you can get um, copper and, mm-hmm. and federal premium, of course, makes some. Um, you know, I did get a shot at a deer this year. I was sighting in with uh, my rifle, with, for which I had copper bullets, and I set it in my dad's and my brother's as well, and they have some. Um, Calibers that I wasn't able to find uh, lead alternatives at the at the sporting goods store. But when I sighted them in, all three rifles, three different calibers, uh, two two lead, one copper, all of them uh, were sighted in within a grouping within a quarter. Nice. Um, so there's there was definitely no drop off in accuracy until I'm I'm successful with the gear. <laughs> I'll I'll have to wait and see on the rest, but I know that I won't have any lead chunks in it. Even beyond. 
accuracy. You know, you, you talk about efficiency and efficacy for, for that lead projectile, that single projectile load, near 100% weight retention. Right. You know, so when, when you shoot, uh, unless it's a, 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 a bonded bullet, a, a trophy bonded or bear claw kind of bullet from, from one of the, the nozzles or a higher, higher dollar, you're actually going to be more expensive than, than, than copper at that point. Right. Um, but unless it's one of those high end loads, you know, anything that's copper jacketed is going to, going to be somewhat frangible when it hits bone, when it hits heavy, you know, heavy dense, you know, anything dense. And that's when you get the, those lead fragments. That's when you get the, the less than 100% weight retention. On, on, on copper, I'll speak to Barnes specifically. That's, that's what I use, the TSX bullets. It's nearly 100%. The, the, and and, and the, uh, the efficiency of that is just amazing. You know, I have a buddy, and I asked about this. Uh, I asked some of my friends you know, who uses it, and one of them said, you know, I hunt for lean, healthy meat, and if I got chunks of lead in that, that's not healthy. So <laughs> um, we've got to go pretty soon, but before we do, um, I want to ask uh, if you could give a quick update. What's going on with the Boundary Waters? Sure. So, so the, the, the Boundary Waters, uh, the proposed mine within the watershed of the Boundary Waters is at Twin Metals and Fagasta Mine. Um, you know, we, we've been working uh, diligently as part of a, a larger campaign with the Save the Boundary Waters Coalition. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, we, we had some kind of interim successes, uh, you know, a couple years back, you know, as far as, uh, you know, the uh, mineral withdrawal had been proposed. And then there was a two year kind of research period that that that, that stayed any process of, of mining. Um, you know, unfortunately, now the, the current administration, the Trump administration's wound that back. Uh, and kind of greenlighted uh, the mine, if you will. Uh, the the permitting is moving forward. Uh, not only is is it been greenlighted, but also the the environmental safeguards, uh, the, the the full um, uh, research and other, you know, the the, the full research requirements and the full uh, permitting requirements have actually been wound down to to an environmental assessment, uh, which is a lower standard, uh, unfortunately. And so we're we're fighting right now. I know there's some litigation underway. Uh, that that NWF is reviewing. Uh, I'm not sure if we're going to join that at this point, but but we are watching that closely to see kind of next steps. Um, but not good. You know, I don't have anything good to report, unfortunately. There. Um, it, but once again, I think I'll, I'll, I'll even bridge back to our lead discussion. You know, I mentioned the externalities of costs, and so when we look at lead alternatives, copper is what flows to the surface. Um, you know, this is a proposed copper mine, and so as 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 hunters, as conservationists. You know, we, we have to think about, you know, the, the decisions we make, even in something as simple as what, what, what shell to use, whether it's hunting deer, geese, or otherwise, um, you know, what, what is the externality that costs? Not only is what's, be, what's being deposited after you pull the trigger, but also what, what's being sourced to make that metal. And so making sure that we're, we're, we're being responsible advocates at all points within that, within that stream of commerce. Right. If we need copper bullets, we need copper. There are right places and, and not right places to do that. <laughs> Probably right next to the boundary waters is not the right place to do that. But it certainly has to come from somewhere, and we have to, we have to balance that. So, people want to know more about Minnesota Conservation Federation. Where they can where can they find out about you and support your work? So, go to our website at www.mncf.org, um, and uh, feel free to communicate to us via that or also on Facebook.